so thanks for joining us, everyone. We're here with Steve, um, the founder and CEO of The Stork, um, this wonderful product right here that we're going to talk about. We're, we wanted to talk to Steve today so that he could educate all of you on um, why he created the product and um, why we recommend it and how it's used. So Steve, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Where are you so guys at? Where are you guys at today? Yeah, so, you know, I guess the, the first question you had is, is, is very interesting is, why infertility? Why, why a product for infertility today? Well, infertility has been growing dramatically uh, over the last 20, 30 years. In fact, in 1960 and 70, it was just one out of every 20 couples were having a problem conceiving. Then, in the 80s, one in 15, 90s, one in 10. 2001 and 8, and today, 2015, the Center for Disease Control states that one out of every six couples are having a difficult time conceiving. So my wife and I had the problem. My brother had the problem. He now has twins in San Francisco. Um, and uh, we all are knowing someone that's having a problem. So what we wanted to do was figure out a way that if we could take a proven medical approach and take it now into the privacy of the couple's home, wouldn't that be wonderful to help couples now with any conception? Because today there's nothing available over the counter. That's great, and that's how you and you came up with the product, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And I have a great team. I have a great number of teams that that, that deal with me and help me through this, and uh, make sure I make the right product for the couples that are trying to conceive. And we've had uh, all, we have one employee that's been trying for years. They just delivered their child. You know, I've had family members, and every day we get a call from someone telling us their success story. And that success story always has to deal with, well, let me tell you how long it took me, the things I used to do. And when the stork came around to help me, my life finally got fulfilled. So it's a wonderful way for us to feel good about what we do, and it sounds great that we're actually making a difference for many couples. That's wonderful. I love hearing those stories. So that's great to hear. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I've been using uh, and recommending, not using, but recommending the stork for some time with a lot of my patients for those who I think it's appropriate for. And we hear a lot of the same stories as, as what you just described, so that's great to hear as well. Yeah, yeah, nice. we're really excited about it. <clears throat> so, um, so you guys created because you were having issues and you thought that there might be a better way to approach things? Yeah, here's, here's actually what my environment was. My environment was I'm sitting with my wife in an endocrinologist's office, a fertility specialist's office, um, and I knew the doctor because I worked with him on other projects, mm -hmm. and I talked my, with my wife in there. We're around seven to ten couples, and uh, the doctor goes, uh, Carrie, come on back. Steve, you stay in the waiting room. I know you too well. Let me get to know your wife. So he goes in, and I'm sitting there with this group of of, of future parents, and they're all talking about the complexity and the wise tales and what they're doing and what they're not doing and the stress written on everyone's face. And then the cost of what assisted reproduction is today yeah. is, is, is phenomenal. So what doctors have been doing for years, and the stork is built off of what doctors have done for years, called cervical cap insemination. Mm -hmm. But from the 1960s to today, no matter what approach you do from intrauterine insemination to in vitro fertilization, all of them are just trying to get the egg and sperm closer together. Sure. So we, what I said was, well, is there a way we could bridge that gap earlier to keep it private for couples than doing it in the you know, non-private world in the doctor's office? And, you know, women and men are so different uh, in this fertility <laughs> space. And one of the interesting things is, you know, females have a long history working with a doctor. They start at age 13, and they work yearly, and they have a great relationship with their OBGYN and family practitioner. Uh, and they, today, they don't go in and just ask questions about their health. They tell the doctor, here's what's wrong with me, here's what works, here's what doesn't work, and help me, you know, help me get better, right? Right. Men, on the other hand, stereotypically, we're the boo-boo guy. We get boo-boos, we get cuts. There's not a lot we have done until we're about 35 
we visit our doctor for our first prostate exam. So <laughs> that is our familiarity with doctors, right? And when you say what a urologist is, no one even knows. So when you put that all together, uh, and if you're looking about fertility, uh, females have a one-up. They know a little bit more about it. But on the male side, in our optimal fertility years, we really don't interact with physicians. So for us to begin that process such a, in a late time period to try to figure out their fertility, they're really not wanting, they're, they're not the proactive part of the relationship. Mm -hmm. So our technology kind of helps both the male and the female. And in any kind of this complex disease state, we kind of just nudge the stork a little bit. We help them along the path. We're not utopia, but what we do is what we do is what doctors have done for years. We put the egg and sperm closer together. That's great. So, how do um, well? How do couples decide that they should be using a cervical cap and doing home IUI? Sure. So. The, the best way to think about it is uh, when sex is no longer for fun, but for propagation, right? For building a family, right? So all of a sudden, you know, there's there's no perfect time in life. But what ends up happening is finally a couple makes a decision, say, you know, I want to start building a family. What's the next step? And and you could imagine that that think of this from a female perspective for a moment, right? For, from ages 13 to 21. They are controlling the reproductive system. Many females are taking birth control pills, not for contraception, but to control their hormones, mm -hmm. right? Then say 21 to 35, I have a 20-year-old son, so 21 to 35, you know, they have a full spectrum of technologies as contraceptive, birth control pills, condoms, diaphragm, plan B, IUDs. There's so many tools to control the reproductive system. So... Theoretically, over 15 to 20 years of their that female adult's life, they've been inundated with controlling the reproductive system. Now they flip the switch. They want to build a family. Sex is no longer for fun. It has a mission. We're going to have an October baby, November baby. They're really focused on building that family. And all of a sudden they go, they don't have the tools to do it. So what they do is today they go over the counter and they go to the family planning section of Walgreens and CVS and look for AIDS. And they have two things today, diagnostic tools. They have pregnancy kits, if you're pregnant or not. Mm -hmm. They have ovulation predictor kits to try to figure out that best ovulation timing to aid in conception. So that's it. There's no aid in conception out there other than diagnostic tools. So... They usually then go to a doctor's and they get a path of diagnosis. So wouldn't it be nice is if they go to pick an ovulation predictor kit up, then they should be picking up a store. If they're trying to figure out their ovulation timing, don't you want to mechanically help the, both the male factors and the female factors aid in conception? So here's what's happened. Here's what's happened over the last 20 plus years is that we are now one out of every six couples having a difficult time conceiving because... It's 40% related to the male, 40% mm -hmm. related to the female, and 20% of a healthy female and a healthy male unable to conceive. So the female factors is age, right? A healthy 22-year-old female, optimal conception has a 25% chance per month of conceiving. So four months of natural fun in intercourse, they're likely to conceive, okay? By the time the female hits 30, she goes down to a 15% chance, right. 35, 10. By the time she hits 40, she has a 5% chance per month at conception. So age is a huge factor for females. And as you know, in our society today, we've slowly, slowly shifted our demographics from trying to get pregnant later and later in life. Absolutely. For the male side, yeah, for the male side, bless our hearts, right? So we <laughs> thought that we're a superman, right? And uh, the challenge is there's been a recent European study that uh, last year stated that the male sperm count has dropped by 45%. So there's a lot of factors in that. Basically, our estrogen and our testosterone levels are a little bit out of whack. Mm -hmm. They talk about food. They talk about water bottles. There's all kinds of different things that people talk about on why the sperm count's low. But the bottom line is we're one in six. It's male. It's female. And together... We're trying to get them closer to success. So when you think about the stork, 
what we're doing is we're just putting the sperm closer to the cervix so when she's optimally ovulating, the sperm have a greater chance of getting up to the egg. And even in natural intercourse, you know, for people that are understanding of that, you know, even when that uh, the event is done, there's always discharge. There's always a little bit that goes away. Sure. There's actually a lot. So what we do is say, listen, if we can do that, and what we've done is, this is what doctors have done for years, mm -hmm. but what makes us unique mm -hmm. is what we said is, today, men know how to use condoms, females know how to use tampons, so if I can have a condom-like collection system, a tampon-like delivery and removal system, could we now do what doctors have done for years in the private show home? And the answer is yes, and that's where the store came along. That's great. You know, I know that um, when I start bringing up this conversation with patients about the cervical cap, they said, like, I've never heard of this. You know, when did it start? And I was like, well, it was before they started doing intrauterine inseminations. They started doing okay. cervical caps. And actually, um, as I'm sure you're aware, the, the success rate for a cervical cap was relatively good. And then when they in started doing inseminations, actually, the percentages dropped a tad, right? Sure. So... Um, there's all sorts of questions around why and, and so forth, and um, but it's amazing to me how patients were not aware that before there was IUI, this is what was done in the doctor's office was the cervical cap. So now you're just taking that and doing it at home. Right. In fact, as, as you stated, there, there's actually more studies coming out today that talk about the value of semen uh, in the mix going intervaginally to prevent the immunological response to reject the sperm coming up. So IUI kind of takes that out. So just to let people know, cervical cap insemination in the doctor's office was done this way. Basically, a male would ejaculate into, let's say, a half of a racquetball, right. right? The female would be speculum. Her cervix looks like a half of a golf ball. Half a racquetball, amounts to half of a golf ball. You know, pull it out, and that patient would stay there for six hours. And then six hours later, and then this is the time period when a doctor's visit was they were only seeing five to ten patients a day, right? So they would stay in the doctor's office, and then they, at six hours later, they would respectulate the female and pull out the cap, and that's cervical cap insemination right there. Right. And then IUI, as you stated, it started growing, and again, the rationale behind IUI was that AIDS and hepatitis were growing in the 70s and 80s, and we didn't want to put, as physicians, raw semen mm -hmm. into cervically. So what they said was, well, let's centrifuge out those proteins. Let's get rid of the semen and just put the sperm directly into the cervix, which, again, is putting the sperm closer to the egg. But, again, as doctors will tell you, um, the poor male has to go into these paper-thin walls in a doctor's yeah. office, sometimes the OBGYNs, perform, and they have about a 40% failure rate for Hey, for, for the males doing them in the doctor's office, it's embarrassing, it's complicated, it's stressful, yeah. and uh, it doesn't help the relationship out much at all. So, so IUI has great value under a physician's care, but still gives you 10 to 20% success rate. Right. Um, and then IVF is, is the most natural next step, and that's saying that, listen, there's a lot of blocked fallopian tubes, the eggs and sperm have no way ever to hit. That's what it was intended for, 1978. Sure. But yeah, five million births later, it's a wonderful approach. But again, um, it's not utopia, and they still only get a maximum of about a thirty-five percent success rate. Right. And it costs between twenty and thirty-five thousand dollars per test. So write your check. Right. You know, it's expensive. It is costly. Yeah. So I I, I love this idea. Um, you know, even before the stork was out, I've been talking about uh, cervical cap insemination. Um, at home. And so when I saw and found the stork a couple of years ago, um, I think I'd met you in, in Los Angeles. I thought it was yes. a wonderful tool because of the way you, it was designed and created for, um, and for application. Um, so I'm not going to open up this box cause this is what we're raffling off to our, our viewers. Sure. Um, but do you have one that you can show everyone what I it do. looks like? I do. So uh, the, it comes like this in a box, okay? okay? It's two parts. So there's a, a male part and a female part. So the male, whoa, 
Yeah, and I, and I play as I throw it across the room. The male part's pretty simple, right? The boys don't have a lot to do, okay? So the male places basically places on a standard condom. It's a little thicker than a traditional condom. So this is not for his extreme pleasure, right? right? But he can place this on and make love to the female the normal way. Nothing changes. So when he's done, right before he falls asleep, like he'll roll this back, you know, off of his mandrel, yeah. right? And he'll basically separate the condom from the cap, and he'll now have a receptacle with all this specimen in it. Great. Okay? What's cool about that is now it's the female's job to be tampon-like. So what the female does is place it into the device, mm -hmm. squeeze the collet until it locks, and then there's three buttons here that can't be done any separate way. So the first button is to pull it back. Okay. As they pull it back, it locks all the specimen with inside the cap. So now it's sealed. Perfect. I stop it, and it's basically tampon like a little bit of a So the seal will get and then it sit down and basically place it into that into that wall, which is what the the cervix. So push button or two, push button. We'll push it and it opens it. And now it'll be open right next to the cervix. At that point, once she's comfortable, she'll push the last button, the button three. Yep. She'll release it. Now, this is left out. This will be left intravaginally, and the string, like a tampon, will be left extravaginally. So now she can get up, walk around, have a wonderful day. We've had people run half marathons with these things in. I know, we got crazy people, right? You leave it in there for six hours. You can go on with day activities. Nothing changes again. All the specimen is right next to the cervix. It's still interacting with the immune system, but it's still having all the right interactions for the product. When they're done, and people love the string because there's a loop on it, yep. right? So you grab the string and pull it out. Perfect. So basically, it's one step, one stop, and it's very condom pipe -like collection and tampon like delivery. It is the very similar to what doctors have done for years, but we gave them all the human factors. And and this is what's changed, right? So I'm 50, and when, when I graduated from high school in 1983, the, the condoms were behind the counter, right? Uh, there was just like one kind. And, and in that process, these condoms were um, designed specifically for contraception. By the time I graduated from college in 1987, we were taught at the United States military, you know, that sexually transmitted disease was becoming prevalent and condoms were a barrier for sexually transmitted disease. So today versus my generation, condoms are flavored, colored, lubricated, everybody knows <laughs> what a condom is, right? So my wife, and she'll kill you for telling her, she's 53, all right? And bless her heart, I've been married for 25 years, and my lovely bride, she came from the tampon generation, and tampons in that time period were a nightmare. Toxic shock syndrome, people living in it too long, and today, it's like paper or plastic, right. right? So from our perspective, all we did, which we think was novel, is that we took condom-like collection and tampon-like delivery and removal, and we took a very complex medical procedure and allowed patients to do this in a privacy of their home. It's stress-free. They don't change their natural process of, of how they interact with it. And it's really the only product approved by all religious groups. Right? Because we don't process the egg and sperm outside the body. So right. Muslims, Sikh, Jews, uh, Catholicism, they all embrace the technology because, again, it is the most natural way and we're not interacting or transferring anything unusual. That's great, yeah. Like I've said, I love the product. Patients give me great feedback on it. Well, they love you. the fact that they can do it at home, so it's wonderful. So where... Um, I know in the past um, they, had, they needed a prescription to get it. How can patients pick one up now? Well, we're, we're very blessed. Today, uh, while working with the Food and Drug Administration, we went from a prescription product to now an over-the-counter product. So today they can buy it on CVS. They can buy it at the Stork OTC, mm -hmm. uh, our website, uh, dot com or storkotc.com. They can buy it at drugstore.com, walgreens.com, so there's many different outlets today that they can get it delivered right to their house, or they can pick it up in the stores at CVS today. And that's nationwide? That is nationwide. Awesome. So 
Uh, and we're, we're growing every day. We hope to be in more retailers here very soon uh, to make it even more convenient for the couples. And again, uh, our focus is let's do it naturally as best we can. This is not utopia. This is not a magic bullet. What this is is it's a natural step to say that any way we can nudge the stork to get greater efficacy is what we're trying to do. We're naturally just trying to get the sperm and egg closer together, and that's all we do, right? Uh, what people like about this is some will use it since you have three days uh, of, of for optimal fertility per month. Right. Some will use it one a day. Some will use it three months in a row. We recommend that if it's not successful after six months, go see your doctor. Okay. Right? There's something else that they need to do. Um, and every day that goes by adds additional stress to the couples and, and, and their lives. And, and we think that fertility should be trying to be fun. Uh, it should have that little spark. Uh, and not everyone needs a super jetpack to get from point A to point B. Sure. And we've had a lot of success with this. That's great. And for, for um, viewers that are watching this who are international, can they just, just I guess, do you guys ship... Uh, do they ship internationally? We do. We have uh, we have distribution in Canada okay. today. We're in 900 retailers in Canada. Uh, we're also at uh, Super Drugs in the United Kingdom, and we'll be in Australia in the summertime. Great. So, for, from the perspective of distribution, we're there. Uh, and then, as uh, the end of 2015 closes, we'll be exploring more countries uh, in 2016. That's great. And then. Um, I guess a last question for me. Have you guys done any research to see success rates and percentages? We're just finishing up a, a major study in, uh, called a post-coital study. And mm -hmm. we're, we're doing a study showing how we put that higher concentration of sperm next to the cervix. Uh, because this approach is so well studied and it's had you know, thousands and thousands of study data points over the years, uh, we always kind of let people know that cervical cap insemination isn't new. We're right. not doing anything different other than taking the stress factors out and going to a doctor's office and doing it at home. Right. So there's a lot of data out there that talks about cervical cap Okay, great. Well, um, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to... Uh, tell all our viewers how it works and and tell them a little bit about the stork um, like I've mentioned before we're going to be raffling off um, a stork and so all that information will be low will be below in the video um, and if you've got any uh, more questions for us or um, about the stork um, just post them below and we'll see about answering them thanks so much Steve and if they get if they actually get pregnant with that stork yeah if they call me um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll get them a nice gift Okay, so it is for something fun. <laughs> so either reach out to me or reach out to Steve directly, and one of us will. Uh, go to him. We'll, go to him. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get you something nice. All right, thanks so much, Steve, for your time. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.